Happy ReZero Day, everybody! Welcome back to ReZero on this channel right here. My name is Terminus, and uh, sorry for the delay, sorry for setting out that one week. I had to do it, but we are back and we are going to get our asses into ReZero Episode 3. What happened last time? That's a good question. We're gonna make it very, very short, right? We got a little bit like forward with with greed we got a little no not greed we got a little bit forward with wrath with Sirius. we were trying to get our 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 fight going emilia was doing so good and i loved it i absolutely loved it and the animation was good too despite this supposedly being a low priority animation episode so i'm like okay okay like if that's the standard we're setting, I'm I'm happy, because like I've seen I've seen I I love ReZero, right? I love ReZero to death. I love especially season two because season two was so amazing in terms of like the themes and whatnot, but it had production issues, right? They weren't glaring, right? Like eighty six or whatever, but they were glaring enough to. To kind of give you the idea that oh some some stuff had to be cut here and there and there was like all all kinds of meh stuff going on. I think the best fight choreography wise is still the Reinhardt fight, right? The in the in the very first season, I think episode three or four or something, where we finish off the arc in the capital, and we do have like this amazing sequence where Elsa is going in for the, with the point a few shots and he's 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 deflecting it with the sword amazing choreography we have some cool fights as well right Garfield versus Elsa um the the, the end fight with, with Betty and and Emilia versus the rabbit stuff like that so there is definitely fights in ReZero that are well animated where, where a lot of stuff is happening but if that's the standard we're setting for like low priority animation I'm I'm really happy and looking forward to what we're we're about to see here because shit's gonna go down, right? We have two archbishops, right, and potentially more, depending on like, right, judging from the intro and whatnot. So yeah, we're we're in big trouble because apparently Regulus has claimed Amelia as his wife, seventy uh, ninth. Uh, I don't know I don't know what he does with the seventy eight other ones, but holy shit. I couldn't even remember all of the names if I was him. <laughs> but who knows? Maybe he's just he's got a very good memory, right? And he I'm I'm sure he can differentiate all of them. But yeah, um we're going to jump into it in just a second. I want to get the um, comments on the screen though. We did a couple of things right here and I did actually want to look into that. First I got a couple of comments of like my episode 1 post discussion where a lot of people have been saying certain things. I wanted to highlight what um, Shalek here is saying. He's pointing out that Subaru is 18 and Reinhardt is 20. So Julius is actually the oldest one of the bunch. I, I didn't have that on my radar. Very interesting. Also on episode 2 we had a couple of comments. I do appreciate the comments by the way. I, I read every comment. Obviously we're only gonna put stuff into comment spotlight that are, that we can kind of talk about it for a second or two. I, I well, There's a lot of comments which are like great discussion or hey I love the video and, and whatnot and I appreciate that. I appreciate it a lot really that that kind of gives me a lot of like self-confidence and, and just just a lot of motivation to keep going but we're gonna highlight those of course that are providing some new or interesting information i had a very interesting discussion with 14 mega xlr <laughs> and mr ahal or however you wanna like however you pronounce that both of them were kind of talking about the the thing where we had subaru going on his own right instead of getting the people in his life, Amelia, Beatrice, in here and and trying to make them help with Sirius. And it makes sense, right? I'm not saying it doesn't make sense, right? My criticism was, no, you're falling back into old patterns where you're doing everything yourself. And people have been arguing 
look, the witch cult is right, aiming for Amelia most of the time, right, in Subaru's experience. And for Subaru, Amelia is one of the few few people who s still kind of keep him going, right? Because we we are in that at that point in time where Rem is lost, not lost per se, but lost for now. And this was a grave mistake that Subaru made, and it's it's certainly probably a, a big, big has been a big, big learning experience for him in terms of things he wants to avoid at all cost in the future, things he he deeply regrets, right? That he wasn't more aware of the fact that there could be checkpoints where he can't go back and actually fix the things he wants to fix, right? That was all before we figured this stuff out in season two, where we did go out of our way to actually kind of compartmentalize and analyze how the power of return by death actually works and what we're really working with in terms of what the the conditions are for being reset and and whatnot and we figured out that the only condition is that Subaru actually survives throughout all of this which is kind of problematic if he wants to save all of these people that he likes and holds dear and whatnot but Emilia is like the main person the the, the like the person that he can under no circumstances lose or have something bad happen. And I understand that 100% that this is the reason why he doesn't want to involve her in these things. But at the same time, and that is my personal point, right? At the same time, it is still a mistake. Because what did we learn in season two? What did we learn in season two? Not just value yourself more and don't go it on your own, just sacrificing yourself constantly in order for all those people around you to not suffer. But also, you need your friends, you need your 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 loved ones to actually get, get through this. You need to keep involving them, you need to keep trusting them, and you need to understand that they trust you, right? There is a mutuality going on. Don't you think Amelia, if she was in his position, would be thinking, oh, I don't want to involve him in this because he could be dying and I couldn't stand that, right? I couldn't I couldn't live on without him. Yeah, I do I do think so. I do 100 percent think so. But the problem with that is with that kind of thinking, and I think in like if the roles were reversed, Amelia would be thinking a little bit differently about that. But that's also because Amelia had a certain a certain past that if if the roles were reversed, she wouldn't have that past. She would have Subaru's past, and then we would be back to square one, which is Subaru's Subaru's tendency to be too afraid to involve other people and and stubbornly go go it himself right to try to solve the problem himself without actually involving these people and he needs to he needs to and yes 100% understandable why he doesn't but we have learned that lesson in season 2 we have learned it with with relying on beatrice with with seeing how capable amelia is if she plays in conjunction with you, right? If she has the information, like the steps she took, the character development she had. And Subaru should be knowing that more than anybody else. I mean, he needs to resolve, right? I understand he is afraid. He's afraid of losing her, but he needs the resolve and the trust in her to actually go through with it despite that and be like, okay, whatever comes, we're gonna face it together. And he did that, right? Once he got forced to do it, actually, in episode two, when Emilia was like, you can tell me to go back, but I ain't gonna go back. I think that's that's perfectly, like, reasonable. I think Emilia's decision here was the more reasonable one, and this is also why Subaru didn't stubbornly just refuse to involve her in this. Just right, um, beyond the fact that she probably would have involved herself with it anyway, and time was ticking, right? But... He was like, all right, you know what, you got me, I can't kind of, like, I don't have any logical arguments to convince you to not do it. Because I know you, you're your own human being. And I think that's like, that is progress for Subaru, right? To recognize that and be like, you are you are not like a princess in a castle, you're your own human being, you, I know you're capable. I'm still afraid, but we're gonna do it. And now, unfortunately, I'm afraid that this experience with Regulus, I don't know what he's gonna do, but he's probably gonna take her out of here if 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 i would venture to guess from what we've seen 
that it's going to teach him the opposite, right? That it's going to teach him, I knew I wouldn't like, or at the very least, it is easy to go back into that cognitive pattern, into that thinking pattern of, I knew I shouldn't uh, shouldn't have involved her in it because now she's gone and I don't know where she is, right? Or now she... Now, now she's in the arms of of, of Regulus, and he he's claiming her, and she's he's not letting her go, and and I don't have the power to actually do something against that. So I do hope he's not learning the wrong lessons from this, and I do hope uh, I don't know how we're gonna go on <laughs> if we're gonna just. I mean, Sirius is still not dead, right? So there's this as well. Like, who's gonna solve it when when Amelia gets the fuck out of there, right? Like, if she's, I mean, she's out of the equation by being put down by Sirius, no matter if she's gonna, if she's gonna get whisked away or if she's gonna stay here. We have two archbishops right there, or potentially if Regulus is gonna go away, we have one archbishop that we can't deal with right now, so. Yeah, there's that. Huge problem, huge problem. Anyway, I did also have some interesting comments on on the OP, we do have the fact that when I was analyzing the OP, we paid a lot of attention to Reinhardt actually having his sword drawn, which was a very big thing in the beginning in season one, where we talked about, or where he talked about the fact that the sword can only be drawn if there is a an opponent that is worthy. The interesting thing about this is the sword was actually still in the sheath. Uh, thank to thank you to Assassin Twenty One for that one for for pointing that out because. It means that the opponent he's facing is still not worthy of the sword to be fully drawn. And we know we only had one instance where the sword was actually able to be fully drawn, which was one of the unthinkable presents when Reinhardt came to, to kill Puck before he destroyed the world. So yeah, there's there's a power scale for you here to, to kind of gauge in which, like... In the future, right, when when Reinhardt actually doesn't draw his sword, I mean, draws his sword, but it's still in the sheath, you know that this is below Puck in terms of the level and whatnot. A bunch of people have actually been saying that Puck has been nerving Amelia in the long term. I don't know if that's true, actually. I mean, not necessarily. I think in more in the char character development sense, right? He's been nerving her because there was never a real need for her to evolve because Puck was always there to cover up for that. So there is this like, obviously we also have the memory stuff, but beyond that, I mean like in terms of abilities, fighting abilities and whatnot, I think the big thing for this is actually Emilia developing on, on a personal level and on like a capability level, on a skill level, because Puck is not there and she has to actually, she has that evolutionary pressure basically right? Immediate dangers, people she wants to protect beyond herself, of course, as well. And she needs to do this, right? She is capable of it, she knows that, but it's like, if especially if you've seen like frozen bonds and whatnot. But there's the, there's that differentiation, if we look back at season two, between being very powerful and actually being able to control that power. Because if you have a lot of power, if you have a lot of strength, you have a lot of energy and whatnot, but you can't control it, this is almost worse than actually not having that power or energy, because you can hurt a lot of people in the process. So that is something to, to definitely think about. Also, yeah, somebody somebody pointed out that that uh, my video reminded them of Psychulturist. Shout out to Ed, Psychulturist. I've seen, I think I've seen, recently actually I've seen most of your Evangelion reactions. I enjoyed the, the heck out of those. If, if you haven't seen those yet, they, I think they're not on YouTube. Like, I think episode one or two are on YouTube, but the rest of them are as VODs on Twitch. So go check those out. Absolutely amazing. Especially, like, seeing a psychologist react to Neon Genesis Evangelion is always absolutely uh, made me made me giddy watching it. Gotta say that, but yeah, uh, shout out to it. And I think with that, we yeah, we we have all of the comments done. Basically, somebody pointed out, uh, confident Amelia is amazing, and I 100% agree. There there is something like in in season one and two, and it's true, right? For the most part of season one and two, she was more or less very much a glass cannon in terms of her capabilities and she was kind of a princess in the castle, right? She was cute, 
she was she was adorable she was she was our protagonist's main main um romantic interest but beyond that she wasn't much more and in season two core two she actually became more than that on a character level and now in season three she actually becomes more than that not just on a character level but also on a on a skill and capabilities level and it's amazing to see it isn't it great to to have like confident win women in your media and they don't need to be like the the typical stereotype of like the barbarian D and D right five e barbarian right um, muscular woman. They don't need to be that stereotype to be actually a strong and confident woman. I think it doesn't matter how a woman looks or how a man looks or how how they what kind of characteristics or personalities they have. It's very interesting to see somebody be steadfast and and unshakable in, in, in against adversity right calm minded as opposed to your opponent being being erratic right i mean obviously we all love our erratic or or chaotic evil villains who who just absolutely destroy the entire fabric of our reality as they they make their way onto the stage as Sirius has been doing for the last couple of episodes but there's also something about a character who in their in their basic principle are noble they have noble goals they 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 have human weaknesses as well but they also they find the strength through character development through through the people that support them find the strength strength to actually to actually stand their ground right and and not be shaken by adversity and there's something very special about that but yeah <laughs> enough rambling Let's get this started with episode three of ReZero. I am very curious as to what we're going to adapt, right? In terms of like the light novel and whatnot, could be all kinds of different aspects of, of what's been happening there. But let's see this. ReZero season three, episode three starts in a three, a two, a one. And right back into the action. All right. Mm hmm I think Subaru hasn't seen him yet, right beyond like our little bump in earlier. <laughs><笑><笑> わかるでしょ。させるよね、普通は。それをしないってことは、つまり相手の人格の否定だ。他者の権利の侵害だ。無欲で理性的な僕に対する権利の侵害だ。終わるか。Bro keeps rambling. He's yapping more than me. そう、それでいいんだよ。相手を尊重することで自らもまた尊重される。<laughs> oh fucking shit! Okay, we are in the we're in the OP. Okay, I can talk a little bit. By the way, I have like an idea. I don't know if I'm going to do it this episode or if I'm going to start next episode. I might do um a couple of pauses throughout the episode. But I might do that next episode, I don't know yet. Do let me know if you actually sync these up. So if you sync these up, most of you, then I might not do, do the pauses. But if you don't sync them up and you just watch along and whatnot, I might actually do the occasional pauses, considering that we actually have a couple of, like, most of the material in there in terms of sound and and visuals and 90% of you have seen this episode already so I still love this shot of Priscilla it's amazing I do wonder if I Some of these scenes, I don't know if they actually are canon, or if they were done right just for the UP. 
So some of these might not even be spoilers for you all. Holy shit, Otto has no idea what's happening. Baum them? What, what the hell is that? Mm, this is trouble. No! No! Bro, you don't want to stand here. Holy shit, Otto is like, no. Us. Mm, it's Laibatenkaitos. Bro's just throwing out the insults. <laughs> this is new information for us. Well, not for us, but... Brave little guy. Holy shit. The fuck was that animation just now? Wait, he could touch him? Dude, less bragging. What even is he doing? Oh. Uh, yeah. おんなの子に優しくなんてのは誰に教わらなくても当然のことだろ。俺がこの世で一番優しくしたい相手がその子だぞ。花嫁、花嫁って何のつもりだ。言ったろ。この子は僕の妻に迎える。黙れよ。エ
やめろ俺のためを思うなら周りを巻き込むな<笑>あなたのお願いでもお断りしますだってやっとまたこうして of course なのにあなたはまだ前の我慢しろそうおっしゃるそんな見たこともない精霊の娘を連れてどの口で待てとヤクザお前どうせ本当の狙いはあの薄汚い銀髪のハンマーだろそんなにあれが恋しいならあなたの前で焼いてやるわけわかんねえよお前あのさ盛り上がってるところ悪いんだけど<笑>そろそろ時間なんだよね、うん、so crazy 時間は終わり福音書に従うこの僕に感謝するといい w h i l e holding the gospel 式に神父側の列席者がいないのも寂しいし横連ボまでしてた君を招待しないってのもちょっと哀れで薄情すぎる話だだから<笑> Ooh, no, that is not good. さっきまでの君の失礼な態度だけどこれでお愛子ってことにしよう I was an act of mercy, you didn't kill him Ooh, what everybody? Oh no, everybody has been blown up. Yeah, we're all clapping with one of our legs blown away. Saved by the gospel, I guess. Well, she's gonna blame herself for that one, right? We have all these people walking around the town just nonchalantly, not knowing what's, what's about to happen. Oh, yeah, we see what happens. Her truthfulness is like Mimi's truthfulness is disarming. もうご飯の時間だし、お客さんには帰ってもらったら、お姉ちゃん。どうも歓迎されてねえみてえだし、おいつもさせてもらうとすっげえ。ええなんで？なんでもクソもねえや。後悔のあらけずりってやったろうが
それはどういった意味でしょうかそのまんまの意味だよレイドはいつでも真っ向勝負ってな本当はリーシアって名前なんじゃねえのかあ,あなたはあなたは妻の何を知っていらっしゃるんですか、うん、実は俺様も知りてえことなんだよどうやらあなたには本当のことをお話しすべきのようですねうリアラは私と出会った15年前からその以前の記憶がないのです。And there's the clue. 記憶がねえだと嵐の夜のことでした。私は商談の帰り道、大きな崖崩れの現場に遭遇したのです。妻はその土砂災害に巻き込まれ、生き埋めに。母ちゃん、お母さん、行ってくるわね。あなたのお父さんを連れて戻るからそれまで待っていてね事故のせいか And there we go. もう覚えていなかった分かったのは着衣にあった取れかけの名札から名前にリの文字があることそのまま彼女の名は夜に咲く花の名を取ってリアラと呼ばれるようになりましたそれであんたと結婚したのかよ私は妻を愛しています彼女は私の妻で大切な女性です。There's so many things that's, that are probably going on in his head. ですがお尋ねしたい。あなたは私の妻、リアラとどういったご関係なのでしょうか<笑>俺様はあんたの。奥さんと何の関係もねえさ申し訳ありませんあなたは何を言っているのかゴージャスさんとミミさんも一緒でリアラどうしてこれ私が作ったソアリエです味には自信があるんですよあおーやったーお菓子嬉しい<笑> Uh, Mimi being here is a godsend, not gonna lie. Gorgeous Mimi. 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 g o r g だってガーフとリアラの匂いすごい似てただからそっかなーってなんだよそれよあの人は俺様の母さんなのかな We gotta be so confused けど俺様が名乗り出ても何にもならねえよーし Yeah, but he still would like to, right? 男ってなんか泣いていい場所じゃないと泣けないでしょ<笑>This has been so long. Such a long time coming. You don't? Oh, 
Holy shit. Wonder who she had as her primary, like, person of care, if that was actually Anastasia. That doesn't sound friendly. <laughs> So, so this is the voice we're going for. All right. Oh, hey y'all. How you doing now? <sighs> and not the only one. Yeah, she probably spent a lot of mana on this. <sighs> what are you doing? I'll actually save this ass. And Felix. Interesting how that works, right? Reminds me of Felt in, in Season 1. Right, one time is okay, Felix, but please. You're not wrong, but... <笑>ありがとう。どういたしまして。あるもん助かった。ちなみに俺はちゃんと霊が欲しくてやったことだぜ。上に苦しさ。At <笑> クリステラの住人会。うん、インフルエンシャル、ライト。そうなると、やはりあの放送は事実と考えて間違いなさそうですな。放送? <laughs> Mm, they would all drown. Lagunica? Like the country? Alright. We got this, we got this. Winnable? It was a trap for somebody. What witch? 
その魔女の遺骨が今も都市のどこかにあるゆうな Which which though? This is important. When it pours, it, it when it rains, it pours, right? Of course he is. Of course he is. Holy shit. All right, all right, ladies and gents, let's let's talk about this one. Ah, uh, ha 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 ha. We're gonna go right into it. Without any further ado, a very interestingly paced episode, I would say. Um, I'm gonna actually. Oh, I have to reapply the. Yeah. Had to reapply the subtitles. Um, subtitles provided by FBI this time. Thank you, FBI, for for the corrected subtitles. All right. Um, we start out with this one, which is very, very interesting because we do see the the beyond obviously the the, the regu regulus's rant going on. The yap god. <laughs> I heard. I heard actually Ed call him that. So. Kind of fits, right? Dude is very, very desperate to to hold on to formalities and rights, but it's very interesting that there's there's archbishops which are absolutely crazy, right? Battle goose, or in this specific case, you do have you do have Sirius as well, who is absolutely going crazy. Makes sense, right? With the theme and everything that we've got going on and her relation to them, but. We do also have some of them which, while they have their very eccentric way to, to deal with things, they are on the more reasonable side. Now, I say reasonable, but I mean reasonable within the confines of their own logic, right? Within the confines of them actually being the center of the world, and that makes sense for greed, right? Oftentimes, at least that's what people, that, that's what's generally being assumed in terms like in, in psychology is that narcissism, um, and I'm not talking about like necessarily narcissistic personality disorder, but this one as well, right? But like trait narcissism can come from this place of deep insecurity, right? From this place of having done, having made experiences in life that kind of make you very fragile on a on a certain level right and then if you talk about narcissistic personality disorder there's I think there used to be i don't know if that's still the case um since i don't know as much about personality disorders yet but there used to be subtypes to that and one of the subtypes was very much based on that idea of that insecurity that deep insecurity that is getting overcompensated in a way by just having this air of arrogance uh, to the outside and, and trying to constantly cling to things that cling to to rights cling to to the positive aspects of yourself right and and putting them at the forefront making yourself the center of the universe which is to a degree not not the most terrible thing right a little bit of selfishness is actually very healthy for a human being, but it is the degree of selfishness, right? The degree of which we interpret everything being pointed at ourselves that can put that into the into the category of being pathological, right? Uh, maladaptive, of being being problematic for yourself and for people around you, because it's not just the positive things that are being that that you project onto yourself right you're being the best thing that ever walked on this earth is kind of the stereotype that we go with when it comes to narcissism but there's also this aspect of when somebody says something bad or looks kind of weird or funny that you might interpret that as oh 
they mean me with that, right? They, they're, they're sliding me, right? And there's this whole idea about, right, if you're, if you're just getting in somebody's way without intending to do so, there's still this idea of, hey, they did that on purpose, right? This this aggression, this negativity, this this like inconvenience, it is directed exactly at me because these people they they they're kind of jealous of me, right? Of what I have. But that's how I see it at the moment. I, I can't like there's not a one hundred percent guarantee that this is actually applicable. Like I said, personality disorders are still something I know the least about in terms of all of the the disorders that are out there on on the psychological spectrum but still that is kind of what you connect to trait narcissism right that that constant referral to yourself with everything that other people do say and everything that happens and you do see that a lot in regulus you do see his constant tirades about how he's being disrespected how the right how you're right and and when he's disrespecting your rights he's not talking about that right when he's inadvertently stepping on your toes then it was natural that he would misunderstand because he didn't have all the information but it, if somebody else actually does that and they don't have all the information then it's a slight to him it's a violation of his rights right and i do feel like at least that's 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 what's coming across here. Regulus is clinging to all of these aspects, clinging to all of these things, his rights, his, 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 like, his wife's, his, his money, all of this stuff. Right? We don't know about his money, but it, he looks like a rich guy, right? Because he desperately needs those things to uphold his, his ego, right? His, 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 like, image of himself and if he didn't have these things if they got taken from him if there's this like uh in psychology we often speak like about loss of control that's a big thing in depression as well when it comes to to how an early experience of loss of control can kind of or at least that's one of the going like one of the running theories can kind of cause you with all the negative experiences you have in life and and experiencing the loss of control within those can kind of prime you onto a behavioral pattern of kind of hopelessness right of like helplessness of the feeling that everything that's happening to you all of these negative things they're not changeable right they're generalized across all the things right internal and i do feel like there's like a shared aspect here because Regulus likes to be in control or Regulus, his entire behavior, the way he talks, the way he, he claims the space for himself. There is this desperation to have everything under his control, right? To have everything to himself. And we do see like we did see the, the, the crass contrast to that in episode two when we were um, having that moment with Priscilla where she talked about everything belonging to her right right in on in a metaphorical sense although she might see that a little bit differently but everything kind of belonging to her and if that's the case it doesn't matter where they are or what they do or that they're not right by her or that she doesn't like always have the the opportunity to to have them within reach and claim them and whatever because for her it's like natural right if you if you have a bird if you have a pet bird you can let it fly, right? It doesn't matter where it sings. It sings for me anyway, right? In this, everything in this world exists to please me. That is Priscilla's kind of general setup, which is very interesting, a very interesting way to view the world and certainly in a way to view the world that kind of gets you, um, kind of puts you at odds with other people, but not as much as Regulus, who is so desperate to actually get everything. Right, to, to actually, and this is very interesting because we, we've seen so many interesting aspects of, of the, the, the sins, right? Basically, the, the seven deadly sins in this, this specific anime, where there's so much unconventional, right? We think back to Daphne, who was like, I was so hungry, I didn't want the world to starve, so I made beasts uh, that could feed the entire world, but it would only be fair if the beasts themselves could also feed on the entire world. And then we have that problem. We do have Echidna who is like, holy shit, I want all the knowledge, please, please. I'm so like 
curiosity, which in a way is greed, right? Human greed, curiosity, although, I mean, it has an aspect of creed within itself if you think about that curiosity is our desire to constantly learn new things and develop ourselves creed might be like an extreme form of our desire to constantly right better our standing in society to acquire to acquire tools to acquire abilities to acquire to to acquire resources right in this way creed can manifest itself in our in, in our desire for objects, right? Especially if they have some, some kind of, if they're a status symbol or have some kind of value. In our desire to have a lot of social standing, right? Have a lot of like social networks and be very connected with people. That can be greed as well. Regulus is displaying some of these aspects, but it, it, he's also displaying a very interesting aspect, which is that greed in, in many forms, not in all forms, I don't think that in the form of Echidna, it's more like greed at the expense of other people, right? Or rather, not, not, not in that way, but greed irregardless of what happens to other people, right? It's just like the immorality of, of research, for example. If you conduct research and you really want to find out a certain phenomenon, but there are moral boundaries that are holding you, and Echidna is just walking over them, right? Echidna is just, like, despite all of these boundaries, she doesn't have boundaries. Her, her curiosity knows no bounds. That is the greed in that. And for him, the greed is is more the aspect of greed because, right? Not not greed in spite of but greed because and the, the because in this case is because without that greed without the accumulation of all of these things that i want to myself without constantly trying to claim in my rights i feel like i would be stepped on right i feel like i i would be constantly the the like the the beaten dog at the end of like i would i would constantly be drawing the shorter stick basically it's very interesting because that that kind of tells for me that there's a deep insecurity in that. What Regulus and Echidna share though are is supposedly or apparently their superficiality when it comes to certain concepts. Right? Where he's like, what what else is supposed to what else is supposed to be desirable about her other than her face, right? And it's like I saw a pretty face. Now, now you're my wife, <laughs> and you're like, bro, bro. But yeah, that I mean, it's it's kind of also all of these these behaviors of the archbishops kind of tells you that there's certain structures within this society in Rezero here, within this society that accept that, right? Accept that kind of behavior because otherwise they would be monsters who are feared or whatever and surely probably they are within circles that really know them but there's a lot of people that don't know them and to exist within society they have to actually talk to people they have to interact and even if they interact through proxies who's probably serious who has followers like battle goose i would assume even then they exist within society so there is little pockets within society structures power structures personal stuff that actually kind of tolerate people like that or don't realize how terrible these people really are until they start doing shit like that. It's very interesting how that how that works out. But yeah, um, a little bit back here. Um, we do have like a burning intro. Really love that. All of these faces of like Regulus being like, but see, look at that. That that's not that's not disdain. Right? Look at that facial expression. There's no disdain in there. There's no no clear arrogance, right? What I read here is fear and disgust, at the very least, right? And that's that's universal, by the way. Look look it up. There's been a lot bunch of studies regarding facial expressions and how universal they actually are. I think disgust is still one of the least universal ones, right? So because certain tribes that they ask actually can't identify it as much but there might be language barriers so it might still be be the case that disgust exists they were just not as accurate in identifying disgust either way though disgust being a very social thing right so it's possible that other societies which work a little bit differently might might have different 
aspects of disgust, right? Or might have different ways to express disgust. But either way, like, maybe disgust, but even more than disgust, I do see fear in here, right? Where he's, where he's going on about, like, the denial of his rights and all of that stuff. And the more he's going on about that, and you do, you do feel like he's shielding himself, right? The way he, he's leaning back and he's looking at you from, like, because there's, like, a way we, we move our body and whatnot. If we move our body away from somebody, this is, like, almost a defensive, a defensive kind of movement, right? It's kind of a defensive stance, so it feels like he's defending himself in this very situation here when he's going on about his rights. And as soon as uh, Subaru's like, I guess, humoring him in a way, he's like, all right, all right, you're fine. Wonderful. And then Sirius goes in and he's like, by the way, I'm still here. Fuck y'all. <laughs> uh, and Otto just picking picking a dessert. But yeah, that is... Uh, town guard. Town guard be like, has the worst RNG in here. Lai just coming in, Lai batting, uh, batting Kaitos. Uh, by the way, also something related to stars, I think. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think it's related to stars at the very least, or to like something along those lines. We do have a lot of different stuff going on in this episode, right? A lot of setup. We do see that all kind of like in all the corners of the city, there's shit going down. As we like see in, at the end or, or here at the end, that they've taken control of all the four towers, which is... They've done that after that, right? They've done that after... Well, I don't know about Capella, but they've done that after that. <laughs> they were like, all right, I guess it's time to go. The book is telling me I need to take control of the tower. It, it's very funny, though, that... Well, at least for Battle Use, supposedly, there was this book that was foretelling his future, his desired future, and if he does what he's supposed to do, then he's he's gonna follow that. But I do wonder if this isn't also kind of... Russell has been saying those are the defective versions of the Tome of Truth, or the, the Tome of Wisdom, which was Echidna's, I guess, um, Echidna's, uh, whatchamacallit, authority, right? Her actual thing, her, her actual power was the Tome of Wisdom, which is supposed to foretell your future. So first of all, what did Echidna foresee? Because we don't know yet, right? Uh, I mean, she still exists kind of low-key in, inside of like that, that whole palace thing, unless Emilia just bumping on top of that destroyed that. But I, I doubt it, right? I doubt she would just let herself get, get like yoinked like that. But also... I do wonder if this isn't just a way of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Every one of these archbishops has their own gospel, which is telling them their own future in relation to what they most want to happen, right? Their their like deepest desire, their 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 highest goal, right? If they live their life according to the gospel, then it's gonna happen, right? First of all, who is to say that? What's, what stands in those Gospels, right? The end goals that each of those archbishops wants to reach isn't in opposition to one another. And if that's the case, then you need to ask yourself, well, which one of them can you trust, right? And what events happen, right? Is there a differentiation between the Gospels where in one of the Gospels this happens and in the other Gospel happens this, right? Because we do know that all of these archbishops, at least supposedly, are right now following the gospel and taking control of the tower. So the question, they, they, there must be some overlap between them. But are they one-to-one? -one? And isn't that just, in the end, right? Isn't that, in the end, maybe a mechanism that leads them to an end? By the hands of Subaru, for example, in the, in the case of Betelgeuse. That was kind of foretold by the true Tome of Wisdom. But yeah, something something to think about, right? Maybe what's what's wrong in those gospels is just the promise of reaching their their deepest desires. We don't even know if that's put in if if that's put into those gospels, right? We, we haven't looked at them, so we don't know if like if if there's not like just a vague the promise of like you're gonna reach all of your desires, whatever, right? Or people just be, like archbishops just believe in that. And they follow the gospel, and in the last page, there's like, you, you turn the page, and it's like, you die now. And you're like, what the fuck, I wanted to... <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, this is like... 
They're in a fucking cult. Hello? I mean, it's not even one cult. That's the interesting thing, right? Regulus is very interesting because he kind of puts the entire witch cult thing in question. Because he, he exists on his own, basically. we never seen any one of his followers. He doesn't feel like the kind of person who would have followers. Right? I mean, the only time we ever saw him interacting with somebody else, supposedly somebody else of the witch cult, is in, in with Pandora. We don't know if she belongs to witch cult or she's instrumentalizing it or whatever. And interacting with Battle Geese, right? When when he was opposite of him and whatnot. But or with Geese in this case, but Geese was still part of the witch cult, so you have to ask yourself what did the witch cult used to be because it feels like they were a lot more neutral or or even good in a way. But yeah, he, he feels that way, right? He, he's so isolated, he's so not following the cult, basically, aside from following his own gospel. So, so this is the first instance where we actually see that personality-wise these archbishops are at odds with one another. Sometimes, right? If one of them, right, gets pissed off because of their own idiosyncrasies, right? If one of them, like, they don't move as a unit, there's a lot of discord going on, and it makes sense, right? All of these people are highly delusional. They're they're absolutely mad. <laughs> so what do you expect, right? To put like eight mad or seven seven madmen in one room and then be like, all right, you all believe in the same thing. Um, Right in the same delusion, basically, or the same conspiracy theory, and then like they're all starting to move at one as one, right? But as soon as like some minor thing happens, one of them is gonna be, hmm, aren't you maybe a traitor, right? Aren't you maybe doing something that I don't like? And then they're just like <laughs> they're just like going at each other, right? That I wanted to actually look at one of those. Um, animation piece yeah this one i i really love that she she was kind of she's taking it up and it's almost like spinning it around like a like i don't know what to say to that right like a vortex or something or like like a spear like a weapon that you're just then swinging around right like i love these shots right when we zoom into the eyes and we actually were zooming out and we have a really nice like rotation shot here almost it's almost like a whip i guess like it's a fire whip. Yeah, it's a fire whip. I love that those like the, the the black lines at the at the center of them. It makes it feel really physical, right? It makes it feel really tangible, grabbable, basically, as opposed to like the the weird swirling, more like blurred out version of the fire effects that we've been seeing so far. It's almost like a fire snake coming out and striking at him. And obviously she, she's way overdoing it with the vortex. But, uh, I mean, yeah. Bro just doesn't care. He's like, whatever. <laughs> I'll leave me the fuck alone, you stupid bitch. <laughs> uh, this is... But here, here we have that thing, right? Subaru is like actually managed to get his get his whip around him. So it's I guess it's conscious. The way he can just repel everything, I guess it's conscious. So there was the chance of like if he doesn't perceive it, maybe you can do something against him. But coming in, he's like, you wanna die that bad. And they have like apparently a spell of their own. It's almost like they kind of phased through them, right? Almost like a self shamak or something. Or a self no, it's not Alshamak, right? Maybe it is. It's a self-Alshamak, basically. Or something along those lines. I, I don't know. I, I don't remember. But they've been training. And now he's, he's like, going into himself. He's like, invisible providence, come on. I do like the shot of, like, his... Right there, where, where his eyes start being reflective, right? Where we do have that gleam in his eye, right? That tenacity, basically. It looks sharp. And right, how it's coming out of the, the, the body, it's like spreading out and going into the camera. That's a really cool shot. And he actually managed to hit him. But obviously, yeah, he, he can't do it all, right? I think it's insane. It's insane that he's actually, what are you going to do if she got hurt? Because I wouldn't think that, right? You would think he's gonna, he's getting mad because he just got touched. But he's not getting mad at that. Very interesting. Something very interesting to note. That in some areas you might 
expect him to be arrogant, but he's not, right? Or expect him to be furious about something, but he's not. So there's certainly aspects of Regulus that are very interesting. You can't always put him down. And I guess that's just part of the witch cult, right? You can't always predict their behavior, even if you see in which, which, which flavor of crazy they are. <laughs> I love that how he's just, just claiming that. He's like, she's mine. <laughs> I mean, yeah, kind of. But also, like, the confidence with which he- and the way he moves his, his hand, right? Really nice, nicely done with the animation. He didn't even know her name, yeah. And he's like, he's like just in disbelief, he's like, what the fuck, what- who is this guy? What- what did- That's all that matters when it comes to love, right? A pretty face. Ooh, where do you start with that? Where do you start with that? Like, with- uh No, it's not all that matters, Regulus. It's it's certainly not all that matters. Very much superficiality in my eyes, right? Like just I mean there's enough people who go through life and think that. But that tells me that like first of all, that, that connection between him and Echidna, but also that there's still a lot to life, or maybe specifically because Regulus is the person he is, right? That there's a lot to life that he doesn't understand that there's more to love. Maybe he has never experienced that. That's the interesting fact, right? That's the interesting thing. What kind of experiences has Regulus made with love that have gotten him to the point where he thinks that a pretty face is all there is to love, right? Being, right, liking somebody's appearance and that he has the constant feeling like that feels the constant need to claim rights for himself, right? And to to kind of put his ego out for everybody to see, right? And everybody to respect and recognize. To hold on to these rigid rituals of mutual recognition because we, you and me, we know that there's more to recognizing somebody than just courtesy, right? And just introducing yourself or saying hello. Obviously, that's common courtesy and you would... I guess you wouldn't take it very well if somebody was outright rude to you or started talking without introducing themselves or whatnot, but you wouldn't react the way Regulus does. So what what kind of experience has he really made with love? Maybe maybe that's the key, right? Maybe that's the core of it. That ultimately what Regulus thinks is that to be loved, you need to have something that makes you lovable, right? Or you need to do something that makes you lovable. That he doesn't believe in unconditional love, that he doesn't believe in the fact that without any, any additional motives, you can actually love somebody, have affection for somebody, show that affection. But yeah, I mean, obviously he's a sin as well, right? There's that, but the question is, how did they become sins? Were they born sins, right? Or did they have certain characters, right, certain upbringing, certain ways they existed as personalities that brought them to a ro row of decisions that led them down the path of finding these witch factors and actually claiming them for him for themselves. Or maybe they were forced upon them. Betelgeuse. Perfect example for that. And she she's ecstatic. She's just out of it. <laughs> it's like, I have found Betelgeuse again. And this is where we get the confirmation where she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Why didn't she see it? Doesn't she smell the witch, right? Doesn't she see the witch? So you can't see witch factors. Apparently, like, the archbishop can't recognize one another. At least that's, like, the inference I get from that. I love that shot with the hand, right? Like, that that's a really cool shot to make. And then the focus pull. <laughs> And their interactions, he's like, don't you get it, you fucking... He's like, of course you would believe that, you delusional bitch. <laughs> and she's like, blah, 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 you keep talking, keep yapping, leave me alone. <laughs> get the hell out of here, don't you get it, you're not needed, right? Get the fuck out. I don't need this bitch, I don't need you. You get out, then everything is alright, right? And I have my... If you're finished here, could you leave already? The way they gesture, the way they, they move, it's... Ah, they take the space, right? I mean, Regulus doesn't, and that's the interesting thing. Like, ex ex 
except for his abilities, he doesn't take the space. He seems very small in every frame we show. He seems very normal, ordinary. Right? And in the books he's described that way as like ordinary looking. After all, we made eye contact, se contact several times when I very nervously stole something off his. He didn't scold me. Yeah, of course, because he didn't scold you. Probably he didn't. He didn't even <laughs> see it. <laughs> uh, he forgave me for uh, uh, when I inhaled his exhale. <laughs> so basically, basically, she has what you would call. Um, uh, what you, what would you even call that in English? I don't know specifically. First of all, she has delusions. That's true. But she has a specific, ki a specific kind of delusions relating to personal relationships, right? Right, where she thinks the person is actually right. There's, there's like secret signs that they love them and and whatnot. I thought there, there's something like that when it happens sometimes with paranoid schizophrenia, for example, where where people think that, I don't know, the moderator who is on TV is actually talking about them specifically. Some stuff like that can actually also happen to you when you're on a drug trip. I'm just saying, right? I mean, there's that connection as well, right? Like it's LSD, well, LSD less because there's like just all, all the filters are off. But like, I don't know, you, you, you're on some very, very heavy THC, right? Cannabis. Yeah, probably that that can happen. That you suddenly think, oh shit, like that dude in the TV, is he talking to me? <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, and and right, the the pathological, that the 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 ill part of that is right, that the 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 outer spectrum of that basically is delusions, um, and these delusions happen, right? And she is very deluded in believing that Battlegears actually showed her affection. I mean, he could have. The way she appears to be presenting her evidence right here is very incoherent. So either she's not she's not properly explaining it right in a way that makes sense for well, a healthy human being, right? Or the things she's interpreting to be love, like be be signs of love for herself, they're probably not. Also, think it's very interesting how they're all just absolutely out of it at this point even when you're asking i must refuse i mean i finally found you again and you still tell me to wait to be patient right so revering somebody respecting somebody adoring somebody but at the same time being like no i don't respect your personal space and your personal opinions i'm gonna be with you no matter if you want to be or not all right all right. Again, with the head, really, really cool. How we how we make the head as big as possible in the face. All right, free period is over. We leave. We gotta follow the gospel, right? The signal is here, and he is simultaneously affected by Sirius, which means everything that happens to him is gets transferred on, onto some everybody else. And Dracula blows his, his half of his leg off. Holy fucking shit! Somebody have fucking mercy with this dude. Alright, so um, I don't like artificially like restricting stuff, but this is already one hour and whatnot. Great, great episode. I love a lot of the things we're doing. I love I love how we went through different different people's perspectives. Otto, we had Garfield, right? Otto was shortly, of course. But we're introducing all of these playing fields, right? All of these locations, the characters that are at the locations conveniently sometimes but or inconveniently and we're actually getting into the threat of things and we're working out some stuff but all of these things are still in the at the level of being processed right this is stuff that that will stay with us for most of the season probably that being said again i really love that i love the introduction of capella that was insane and the, the voice they did uh, the voice actress they used, the voice they used. I couldn't have imagined that, but it, it fits very well. Like, it's really, really cool. All Saving Us, amazing. All Saving Us is, is, is really cool because it gets all in into the action again. And we do know that everybody is kind of alarmed at this point. Everybody knows. They even put out banners and everything. But yeah, 
there's gonna be an extra discussion because I think it warrants it when we talk about Garfield and whatnot. We're gonna we're gonna do a, a little extra 10, 15, maybe 20 minute Garfield and everything else discussion. If you are interested in seeing that, go check it out. It's probably right there. Uh, if you're not, that's fine too. Thank you for watching so far. Go check out my other series. Go check out Discord, Patreon and whatnot. And I'll see you next time for episode four. Thank <laughs> you.